Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show Enoetok preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not, as at Bikini, to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am telling you that the weather is actually friendly <laughs> right now. I'm so excited by that. And our show tonight is going to be also because I have someone on that I really like a lot. He is completely fun. He is witty he's charming he is just a very interesting man and he's a biblical scholar he is he's written a site it is bible by bennett and it covers events of the day news events just all kinds of information and he goes into the biblical prophecy relevant to that and I used to look into those things and I decided that it freaked me out a little bit too much but apparently Frank does not have those types of things that, that bother him he's also a gifted writer of multiple titles and he's just he's just a fascinating man there are very few people I know personally who approach some of the topics that Frank will but you know what? I admire him because he's pretty much fearless. He just 
puts it out there, puts it in a fizz, and Mike rolls on. I do want to say that his books are Encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man, a true story, and the most recent is um, Talk Dirty to Me, An Education of Donna, which I actually find funny, which is good because it's a comedy, and A Ghost in Philadelphia. So I hope that you enjoyed this as much as I know I'm going to. Frank Bennett, welcome to Fate Mag Radio. Kat, it is just such a pleasure to get to talk to you one more time, and I have so much missed you. And that intro, everybody's got to know, if you give somebody enough money, you two can have an intro that good. (laughs) There's not enough money to buy that intro. (laughs) But, you know, I am excited that you're here because, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things that, we cross paths, we interact and have fun doing it, and we don't really connect to have in-depth conversations very often. So I like being able to use my, my shows as a platform for doing that. And I'm glad you're here. So I'm glad to be anywhere, quite honestly. I just got true. back from the West Coast a few, so, a few days ago, and... Every time I come back from the West Coast, I end up sick. Don't ask me why. This time, I, it hasn't happened, and I'm suspicious. I think it's all going to like hit me at once. I'm going to get up tomorrow and get, lay right back down again. I'm sure of it. But uh, right now, I'm playing a wait and see. Oh, well, I hope that uh, that you don't get to see. I hope you I know, don't get to see. You know, I I actually love going to the West Coast. Um. I've never been there that I wasn't doing something or finding something fun to do. But sometimes it wasn't as much fun for other people as it was for me because we were closing an office out there. And I was having to do the grunt work on that. But um, when I go for events and things of that nature, I just love it. I got to do the first Alien Con outside of San Francisco. And that was that was spectacular. It was, yeah, they considered it, it a it, fail. I thought it was brilliant. The, the yeah. Alien Con is a good promotion. It's a great show. If anybody has one coming to your area, I, I fully recommend you go to it. I spoke at one in Baltimore. Uh, they tend to draw uh, a lot of good people and have great speakers. It's a good promotion. Well, it is. And But that one being the very first one, they expected like 3,000 people. They got over 10. That's right. So it was, it was kind of Katie bar the door there because the, you know, they planned for what they expected and got a lot more. So that was interesting. Mm-hmm. And interest in the, in the paranormal aspect of alien UFOs is at an all time, uh, uh, all time peak. All time. Oh, it high. is. I mean, it's crazy right now. There's so much. I participate in UFO Twitter. I think that's fun and interesting. And it's a topic that, quite frankly, has my attention and has for years. I have, I've really been overwhelmed by some of the information that I've heard and learned through my research into the subject. I've I love being educated by people who know more than me. But the things happening now are very dramatic. And once again, due to the nature of, you know, conspiracy and whatever, it's like, is this happening because of all the stuff going on? Or, you know, is this just on top of everything going on? I, well, if you love to be educated by people who know more than you, well, I guess you're not going to be educated by me tonight. I can promise you that. Oh, what ups? <laughs> I know better. <laughs> <laughs> I always learn from you. <clears throat> and I think that what you do is, well, really, it's kind of brave. 
because there are so many people who are not interested or don't perceive anything happening as being biblical unless you've read the Bible right I mean which would help that which would, help would a lot. open your eyes just a little bit how did you come to be such a biblical scholar um, it wasn't my first choice uh, I had to be I had to be put through a lot of uh, of a lot of harshness in life in order to be busted down and broken down to the point where you just give up. And much like the story of Moses uh, being sent out into the wilderness, had to be broken and um, completely decimated so that the Lord can remake him into someone he can use for his purposes. So that's what happened to me. I was just broken and uh, found myself, um, you know, I had evaded God my entire life. And I blamed God for everything bad that happened to me. And uh, I was not a bad guy, okay? I mean, you know, a lot of people will say that. You know, I'm a good guy. He's a good guy, whatever. Um, I tried drinking. I was really no good at it. Um, I tried it a lot of things. It takes dedication. It, it, well, it, but for me, I could drink a lot of liquor and still not get that 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 high that everybody Before else you. yeah i i never hit that i don't know i, re, I remember getting weight completely wasted and then thinking am i there yet am i there yet so i would get actually go, go down the ground and do push-ups just to see how awake i am because it's my understanding you drink until you're blind and i never got that and uh i was just no good at drinking it was just a waste of time for me and exactly it, it honestly was and uh Today, I like like every other guy out there. I work out in the hot sun, and I I want to throw down a beer when I'm done. You just get a taste for it, a cold beer. Uh, I want to sit down on Sundays and watch football. I want to have a beer. I'm like every other guy. Uh, but back then, I was just trying to see if I can get what all these other people kept talking about, and I never did. I was always fully awake and aware. Made me so mad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I never understand. Got a DWI, I am not much of a drinker a either. Yeah, and I was not a bad guy. I, I was a dancer. I loved to be in clubs dancing. That's how I met a lot of my girlfriends. Uh, and then, you know, slaved away in the same kind of, you know, money for nothing jobs everybody else did. And in the mid-90s, I had just gotten to the point where, you know, you can feed the body as much as you like, and it'll either go good for you or go bad for you. And you can cram as much in your head thinking you're going to achieve some form of, you know, mental um, oneness with the universe and understand all things and maybe even conceive God. But that's a dead end. The whole time you're doing that, the spirit suffers. It's it's starving yes. and it's crying and it, 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 it manifests itself in very strange ways. But in the mid 90s, it, it I just hit a breaking point where it uh, dominated everything else about me. And I found myself on my knees inside my condo by the ocean. Yeah, I was living a slave's life. I was, uh, you know, crying to a God I'd been avoiding my entire life to save me. Uh, and, and you know, we're up until that point. I was the very, very intelligent person at the table who was explaining why there can't be a God. I was the guy who was um, – who was so educated and so well read, he was dismantling all of these biblical claims and stories and stuff like that. I was that guy. And so, um, and, but it frustrated me, Kat, that I had read the Bible completely through 11 times solid. Wow. And I, it, could, it never made sense to me. When you read a book, it's supposed to make sense. The Bible never made sense. It irritated the living bejesus out of me. And after I got saved, my salvation experience, by the way, is described in my first book, Encounter with the Aberdeen Wild Man, A True Story. Because people need to know how I got from there to here and how I came about this knowledge. After that, I picked up um, a Bible that my best friend gave me. Um, I had always kept it either on a shelf buried underneath of papers, maybe sometimes holding up the end of the couch when I don't have a leg on the couch, you know, that kind of thing. I picked up the Bible and read a few passages, and bam, I understood it, and I understood it in its context. 
and being saved gave me something I did not realize I had been hunting for my whole life. That is, um, that's normally the case, I think. Mm -hmm. Or I have found. It's, found. It's hard to explain salvation to people who either are not looking for it or, or who are in the mindset I was beforehand. Because I was the one that was looking to see, you know, make myself everything I could possibly be in, everything the world has to offer, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and like I said, the whole time you're, you're clawing uh, for what the world has to offer and maybe being success at, a success at it, your spirit suffers. It starves. Uh, and it's, it's crying for, for, to be fed. It's crying to get out. Yeah. And, and eventually it will win. And unfortunately, when it makes itself manifest in people who are hard-headed, uh, have a hardened heart, have an angst against God, it will manifest itself in people in, in very negative ways. Uh, usually people who have, a, have a, uh, a hurting spirit that's never fed or never, never reconciled usually turn to self-destruction, you know, the cutting and the, the mental illness and things like that. I find that sometimes those people develop them as a result of being told what's wrong with them when there's really not. I mean, I was, That's right. I was actually working a case where a young woman it had poltergistic activity, lots of it. And a young woman, was dressed in long sleeves and a white sweater in August in South Alabama. And I just looked at her. I was like, how long have you been cutting? And she looked just like I had slapped her in the face. And I said, it's okay. I'm not going to talk to anyone else. I said, but you need to know that there's an organization called you know, Twaba to, um, to write on her arms with love and I think I got that wrong, but that's okay. I'll get it right before long. But, um, and I made sure that she had the website and the information before I left. And the leader of that investigation got upset because I spoke with her and I was like, well, then I don't really want to work with you anymore because what we do involves taking care of the people in the homes. And I've never come across someone that needed more help. Just the information. Yeah, that's all I gave her. And that's when I, I realized what I value in paranormal investigation. And why I do it. And why I was brought to it. So, anyway, I digress. This is not about me. This is about you. <laughs> it's about... No, it's about us. It is. And, and, and there are people listening to us now that it's about them, too. It is. And there, there's something in it for them. I would agree with that. And there, yeah, there are people out there who were like me, uh, who are scoffing. And people who, like I said, they have, a, have an ax to grind with God. They have something against God. Because like me, I blame God for everything that went wrong. Why did God hate me? For heaven's sakes. Uh, and you're uh, such a nice they're, guy, they're right? Listening. Yeah. Well, you would, you would, you know, that's the outward appearance. Yeah. That's the outward appearance. And a lot of other people have that outward appearance. Uh, somebody told me that uh, so, somebody on my Facebook said they were watching the movie, uh, Mel Gibson movie, What Women Want from the mid-90s, which mm -hmm. I love. That's funny. I movie. love that movie, so, too. So good in that. Uh, one of the subplots in that movie is that there's a girl in the office who's very mousy and very quiet, and Mel Gibson can read read women's minds now, and he picks up these fleeting, uh, you know, thoughts from her that uh, you know she's she's contemplating suicide. Yes. And you know, tries to help her out and stuff like that, and it it's uh, it's poignant because uh, you know it's amazing how many people out there are so set and sure. And seem to be doing okay, and it just takes very little 
for that security to quickly turn to thinking about dying or thinking about committing suicide. It's amazing how quick it can happen, but it it could be one one instance, and somebody will think, "I don't want to live anymore." Yes, it's it's so subtle. And you know, I have lost friends to that. People that appeared to have an absolutely perfect life, one would think. And you can never judge based on what you see from outside. But we have to take our first break. So we'll be right back. Y'all come back to you. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Come on, I'm Southern, but, um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Kat Hobson Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see if the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. And I am so excited to be that. I am also excited to be joined tonight by my guest, Frank Bennett. We are... We are already going wide open. And Frank, I appreciate you. This is interesting already. Okay. I bet you say that to all the guests. Mostly. Yeah. But usually not this early. Not this early, no. No. So, no, no. But, I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm in an elite club. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, you're someone who loves learning, you're someone who loves sharing information, you are in an elite club. I'm going to tell you, the day that you think you're done learning is the biggest mistake of your life. Because, yeah. you know, there are there's a spirit world out there, and there is a God in heaven, and they're listening to you, and they're thinking, oh yeah? Woo-hoo! Boy, can <laughs> we change your mind. <laughs> Here, hold my beer and watch this. I'm sure they have beer in heaven. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no fermentation. Oh, by the way, hey, I got I got something fascinating for everybody out there because I, I told all of our paranormal peeps that we were going to be doing this. And while I was in California, uh, I got a very frantic um, um, call from my wife back here in Ohio, where all the fun is. And it seems that um, um, our cats came running into the living room, jumped up on the couch and looked at a portion of the wall. And she said she looked at it and spots, stains formed uh, through the paint on the wall. And she was afraid it was something paranormal because we she, we probably watch a few too many of those paranormal shows than we should. Right. Um, and so I asked her to describe it to me. She took a couple pictures. And I said, oh, okay, that's not paranormal. That's chemistry. Yeah. You see, when I when I this is a hundred and four year old house, and when I, the people who owned it before me were really, 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 really heavy smokers. Ah, yes. And so when I got here, it took a long time to cover over all of the tar and nicotine stains on the upper parts of the walls because that's how it, it actually gets carried up into the updraft and the harder uh, particles uh, settle against the upper parts of the wall and then they um, – Oh, what's the word? They kind of codify into a, into a kind of like a, a sap, mm -hmm. and very thick, uh, it, very it's sticky. Like, right, exactly. It's like a lacquer. And so when I, I started treating these walls, I had to do the sanding and a whole a whole bunch of stuff, solvents, you name it. And no matter how hard you try, unless you, you know, take down the walls and put up drywall, you know, under the right uh, conditions, I'm talking humidity wise and mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, it's going to bleed back through whatever paint job you put up. Wallpaper is about one of the only ways to get around that, but uh, tar and nicotine, heavy emollients like that will, will come right through a paint job under the right, uh, you know, thermal conditions and, and, you know, humidity and stuff like that. So it wasn't paranormal. It was chemistry. I had a case that I wound up – a friend – from my workout class called and said, my walls are bleeding. Don't you do paranormal stuff? <laughs> I said, yes, but we're going to take this elsewhere. So I got in touch with a friend of mine and said, she sent me pictures. Look at this. He said, um, it's her drywall and certain drywalls, heat and humidity. You live in Alabama. Her walls are sweating. This is what results from that. So I was just like, Yay. So I told her and she was like, yay. Because she really thought that she needed an exorcist. <laughs> I mean, seriously, because it was red. But um, I imagine your wife was not far beyond that thought. <laughs> well, when she you saw know, it. it's, it's very it's striking. Healthy. It is healthy to entertain the thought, okay? Because I, I see I see our paranormal world as part of the natural world. It's something that exists for its own reasons, and it's going to happen. That's just simply the way it is. The difference is discerning between the paranormal, the natural, and, you know, uh, man-made. It's, it's yes. that's, that's the tough part. And there's a lot of un unforeseen, uh, there's a lot of unseen circumstances in the physical world uh, that make these things manifest that, that we never consider. Well, I hadn't. Now, um, I mean, because I'd never encountered it, and what I had heard was in, you know, second or third person. I did not have a personal experience of that nature. So I was just kind of going like, hmm, we're going to need somebody else to chime in on this one. But we have a question in chat, if you're up for it. Ready? Well, okay, but remember, I failed algebra. Uh, well, I'll, trust me, I probably could okay. not read you an algebraic equation. So, do you believe in the gift of the Spirit allowing some to know and predict future events? Predestination. Predestination is not really prophecy, though, is it? That's when you are already on a path to where you're going to go. Yeah, the best example would be Daniel. 
and uh, throughout the entire course of Daniel's life, Daniel lived. I'm not going to say a normal life because he was with the uh, he was with the um, Israelites when they were taken into captivity in Babylon. But in the early part of his life, he was given his first set of uh, prophecies. In the middle part of his life, he received the second part. And when he was a very old man, he received the final part of his prophecies. So, you know, it takes an entire lifetime uh, for some people to receive these things. And some some people only receive them once and never again. So um, it's, it's, it's really hard to tell who is, the, you know, who or why is determined to receive prophecies. The only I don't receive them myself. I just I see what they I see what has already been written in the scriptures, and I I apply them over what I see going on today. Okay. Well, is predestinate is predestination what you consider prophecy? Well, now, now it's not prophecy. What predestination really is is that there's a belief. In, it's esot, it's an esoteric concept, right? But there's a belief that people were were born into the world already predestined to be saved or not saved, right? Which can't be can't be right because um, when you you know, when you research other scriptures, you know, what would be the purpose of preaching if some people have already been determined to be saved? What would be the purpose of Jesus descending into hell right after his crucifixion to preach unto the dead if they have already been predestined to, you know, for hell? Well, they were already there. Yeah, they were already there. Um, um, you know, there it's called paradise, but, you know, the, he, they had they had to receive the word uh, in order to be um, to be taken into heaven, they, just because they were in the good side of hell and were faithful to God, does that does not mean they were going to be seeing heaven? That means that was a place for them to be held until they can hear, they can see and hear Christ and the, the preaching of Christ, and then they could be taken up into heaven. That's what we refer to as Pentecost. Okay. I'm good with that. That that's and I've received this question before, by the way. But on the when Jesus is on the cross and the, they've got the two what they call malefactors on either side of them being crucified, one of them asks Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom, and Jesus says to him that this day you shall be with me in paradise. And some say, well, why didn't he say heaven? And that's because up until the day of Pentecost, anyone who died who was with the Lord and who followed the Lord um, were put into um, what's, what's called um, uh, Sheol, um, which is the good side of hell or Hades. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's proper to say Hades, uh, but they were in the good side of it. For, for other reference, you can look at the book of Luke chapter 16. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's another description of it. But uh, if Jesus can, can only say paradise, because that's the other name for it is paradise. And so when the both of them perished on the cross, they both went into paradise. They Interesting. They did not go into heaven. Yeah. Okay. And so that, in, in, a, in a real roundabout, that's, that's how you get to that predestination question. Because up until that malefactor at, uh, said these things to Jesus, you, could pretty much, uh, you pretty much can tell he was on a pathway to hell. I mean, he was... Enough of a criminal to be crucified, which mm -hmm, was yeah. for those that were horrendous. Yeah, and and it's amazing that uh, for how horrific being crucified actually is, um, you actually can actually have a conversation on the cross with somebody. That that that's something I can't conceive of. You're in a great deal of pain when you're crucified. Well, yes. I mean it's. I have um, I have researched that because I'm a nosy Christian, <laughs> Christ follower, definitely. And it just is, I, I like to know what I'm talking about when somebody asks me questions. But it is a horrendous method of, of killing someone. Yeah, it's not really, if, if, you know, the Romans know how to kill. That That is... Don't even need to explain that one. 
Crucifixion is not right. Exactly, crucifixion is not about killing. Crucifixion is about humiliation, and it's about advertising to anybody else. This is how we're going to treat you if you do what they do. That's why they put them up on a cross and not yeah. lay them out or anything like that. It's this is humiliation 101. It's extremely painful. It takes a, a good while to actually die on the cross. Jesus only uh, took maybe a few hours. And uh, it, it, uh, it, it's just fascinating they can have a conversation while on the cross. <laughs> you know. Well, wasn't an average guy there in the middle. So. Well, now the malefactors were not treated the same way Jesus was. Jesus got a very thorough beating even before he yeah. made it to the cross. Very thorough. And uh, he had, you know, I've read many books on who exa- on, on people who have really examined the, you know, the biological and physiological effects of, of the way he was treated before he was crucified. And, uh, you know, it's surprising to many that it didn't take long for him to die. But quite honestly, he was half dead by the time he made it to the cross. I mean, he had been starved. Yes. He had been bloodletted and everything. And... Uh, you know, he couldn't even carry his own cross. Somebody had to had to carry it for him at one point. You know, I am I am really interested in all of the things that we see going on now. And when I was reading your Bible by Bennett, um, I was really surprised when I started going through some of the situations that you discuss. And I think probably my favorite thing is that you say, watch. And I find that interesting because in several different versions of the book of Enoch, the, there are the watchers. So, you know, this comes out of Matthew, Mark, another quote from Mark, a quote from Luke. And it says, watch, uh, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. And I'm assuming that is through the tribulation. But... You know, I just thought, actually, I think your whole page is interesting, to be quite honest. Oh, you. Gosh. You must think I have a lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) No, because that's hard to come by. So I just think that, I just think that you're interesting and that you pay attention. And the watching part is universal through so many different areas and well the the word watch appears in scripture no less than 120 times yes no less than that and you know a people people who who you know people who account themselves godly people who account themselves you know christ-like they watch uh they 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 fear god and they fear christ more than they love because uh it, you know you you um it's there there must be there must be this obedience and to watch and to listen and uh like i said it's a reason why the reason why the word watch appears so much in scripture we are always supposed to be watching for what's going on and watching for these signs because we live in a very confusing world and the world is designed to deceive it's designed for it and it's designed to keep you distracted. It's designed to keep you tormented. It's designed to keep you frittering away your days uh, so much that, and you're so occupied, you don't bother to simply watch. Exactly. Or if you do watch, you're so self-focused because you're looking for danger to you or to the people you love or the community that you're trying to be a part of. And, you know, you... It's really interesting because so many of these notions now are considered archaic and people who hold to them are considered, you know, illiterate when that's really not true. It takes a lot of work to know this stuff. 
but when you start to expose deceptions, then you get even more attention coming at you. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, very much so. And, well, you know, you were, uh, before we even started going tonight, you brought up uh, what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah, the Abraham and, Accords. And if, uh, I don't think anybody has really noticed this yet. I haven't heard anybody in the news mention this, but we haven't really had problems like this out that way uh, uh, since Obama left office. And when Obama was in office, this is almost a regular thing, and it got so regular that the news media w weren't even reporting it. And on my web page, I was constantly putting up one news story after another where rockets are you know, being sent by the Palestinians in, into, into Jerusalem, and nobody's noticing. And you know, they only notice when, um, when the Israelis uh, would fight back or send rockets into, into Gaza. Then the, then the news people seem to notice that. And if you'll notice now, <clears throat> they, they seem to notice because they seem to be paying more attention to the fact that the Israelis are shooting rockets into Gaza than the fact that Gaza's shooting rockets into Jerusalem. And uh, the one-sidedness of the reporting is making a lot of people suspicious. Well, it truly uh, is. I've seen so many responses to that, Frank. Yes, you have. I mean, people are people are starting to question global media because you hear all the numbers of injured and dead in Gaza, but the numbers are not so much in in Israel, or they're not being reported. But also, Israel has their Iron Dome because they were always being attacked, and it was given to them by the United States to protect themselves. I mean, yeah. this isn't offensive. This is defensive posturing and behavior. Yeah. And you people know, that, seem to forget that. I, I don't want to take everybody off topic, but you put me in mind the, when you know when we're talking about how the media pays attention to only a, one side of things. I, I I I saw an interview on YouTube about three four years ago, completely surprised me. Okay, is I'm going to stop you. I'm going oh, to stop you me? because okay. this is going to take a minute because I think I know where you're going and we have to take a break. So we will be right back. Y'all come right back to you. And if you have questions, hop on over into chat. You can go to WBHM-DB.com, click on the Fate Mag image, and it'll take you right to our landing page, and you can join us. We'll be right back. Y'all come back to you. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, 
the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to Fake Mag Radio. I'm so glad that you're here because I had to interrupt our guest right as he was going into a discussion topic. But, Frank, I hope you'll forgive me and I hope you remember where you were. Oh, yeah, I do. And I'll be very brief about this. But do you all remember how much we hate Richard Nixon, former President Richard Nixon, who is also formerly alive? Um, I, uh, I was watching a YouTube video some years ago, and it was with um, an um, a, a military commander who was in the Nixon administration. And this has to do with the Six-Day War, the early 70s. And the Israelis were being attacked from all sides, Egypt and Literally. Syria and all of them. And um, the generals went and said, uh, the, you know, there's just, uh, the, Israel does not have the, the, the assets to fight them off. Uh, they need help. And they called Richard Nixon, woke him up in the middle of the night, told him the story. And Richard, Nick, this is Nixon, the evil Richard Nixon. Everybody hates him. He said, he said to them, give them anything they want. And they did. The Israelis beat off all of the other oppressors against them, the, the, you know, the other nations against them, managed to hold on to the nation of Israel, and Richard Nixon is the one you thank for it. Yep. I never knew that. Really? It was never in the media. It was never reported in the media. Uh, it's one of the other reasons why the news media hated Richard Nixon, because they hated Israel. Kind of still do. Kind of still do, yeah. So I, it just when you were talking, it put me in mind of that, because um, you know we are we are all trained up to think of people in a certain way and how evil they are, how evil Trump is, and how evil that is, and these hidden little stories that are floating around, you, you know, they take too long to get to us. Yes. But the United States is one of the big reasons why Israel has been able to hold on this long. That is going to continue, according to Bible prophecy, that's going to continue for a short while longer, because the United States is going to be, within the next 20 years, moving into a phase where we join the world bloc, and the United States will begin to kind of lose the identity that it has now, and kind of, as they like to say, taking its place among the nations. And we will become no more important or powerful than any other nation. Um, we're going to be receiving more and more pressure from the world body, in other words, you know, like the U United Nations, stuff like that, uh, to put more control on Israel. And we will be supplying Israel with less and less arms and less and less defenses. And this is going to force uh, Israel to be a little more compliant with peace deals. I don't think that's something people would be aware of. But we have some questions. And I really hope that that does not come about because I think that, you know, I think that I'm too well read to be comfortable with that. But the questions that we have. And I don't think you're going to have time to get to all of them before we get to the top of the hour. Oh, but, let's do a um, lightning round. That would be great. <laughs> well, um, after the people that were replaced, that were released from paradise, do those who die now that are his children go straight to heaven? Classic question. Do little children go straight to heaven? Here's the short answer. We don't know. There is absolutely nothing in Scripture that says little children go to heaven. The closest, pro the closest approximate um, uh, like to that would be in the Jewish tradition, Jewish tradition 
of accounting young males and females below the age of accountability, which is generally 12, uh, you know, 12, 13 years old. This is where we have the tradition of the bar mitzvah and, you know, the, the, the leading into manhood and womanhood. And everyone who is under that age is what they say covered by God. So it doesn't actually tell us they go into heaven, but it does say that the Lord covers them. And that's as much as Scripture will tell you about it. All right. You will not find you will not find a verse of Scripture that says little children and little babies going to heaven. It doesn't exist. All right. That's as honest as I can be. Good enough. I'm not going to ask you to make it up as we go. I'd, I'd rather hear actual things. All right. Another question is, what are your thoughts on Nostradamus and his predictions? Ah, yes, I've read those. Uh, they were called The Centuries. And uh, I used to, it's one of the earliest books I've read in the early 80s. And I would sit there in the library and go through the quatrains one after another. And they seem to be a lot of, by the way, a lot of um, other writers have commented this way. They, a lot of them, a lot of the quatrains seem to be talking about events from the past, before Nostradamus's time, so much as they are talking about future events. Mm -hmm. And it gets confusing like that. It's kind of hard to tell from his quatrains if he's talking about the past or the future. Well, I think. But it's a good. It's a good read. I would say. It is say. a good read. Actually, it's not a good read until you. <laughs> until you quit trying to reason with it. You just have yeah. to accept it as it is. Otherwise, it'll drive you to drink. It would, like like learning French. Yes. Oh. I, flunk, I yes. flunked that with a passion. Dear God. I had you a little French my, war where I tried to French, teach me. You should have seen my French teacher. Man, I drove him crazy. He would <laughs> be up there grading papers, and he would just sit down his glasses, rub his head, said, Frank... <laughs> because apparently I, I, was, I was, apparently <laughs> I was I was it wasn't that I was really wrong it's just the way I was writing the French words out actually were likened to other French words which were either dirty or filthy or meant something else but I right. I kind of really drove I think I drove them to drink I think I did I could see that you know I am so interested and we'll probably have to get back to this after after the top of the hour break. But, you know, you've got a section in there on, on your page that is about the summer that the Skylab fell, right? It was 79? Oh, dear God. <clears throat> How much time do we have for that? Oh, dear God. Do you you well, got seven I'm minutes. Gonna, I'm not going to do this to Kat because a woman is not supposed to give her age. But when when I was a youngster, Way back in the day, you know, well, you know, here's how it happened. First, the Earth cooled, then the dinosaurs came, <laughs> and then, then Skylab fell from the sky. Yes. And there we all were. They didn't know where it was coming down. They at. did not. And people were that we got advance notice of a few days, and there were people actually selling umbrellas with the Skylab logo on it. They were selling hard hats. It was funny as hell. It yeah. ended up landing in the desert someplace, and. Come on, after – that was 40-something years ago, and here we are today, and we got this huge thing the size of a 10-story of a building coming out of the sky, and they can't track it. They don't know where it's going to come down at, and what's worse is they don't seem to be concerned about it until it I lands know. on your house. Yeah, until it lands on your house. No, they're not concerned about it. Nope. That bothered the living tar out of me because we're sending these little um, drones to Mars and thinking, you know, it's one giant leap for mankind. No, it's a giant leap for some kid on a sofa who can operate something by remote control, but it's not a giant leap for mankind. And you guys jump up and down about that and spend billions of dollars on that, but you still can't tell us if something big's going to land on my head out of the sky? Exactly. That drives me freaking crazy. Well, and. <clears throat> You know, that's another case of they had five years to plan this, right? Oh, because yeah. Because yeah. the personnel left five years. Five years? Was it five years? Yeah. Five years before 
you know, that came down. And mm -hmm. that's right. It was just holy, holy cow. And yeah, now now Cat yeah. was just a itty bitty baby back then. I mean, she she didn't she didn't they they <laughs> they, they gave Cat a, a little bitty baby hard hat and a, a little banner that said "Go Skylab," and that's all she remembers. <laughs> <from it. laughs> I wish I had one of those umbrellas. That would be a, a talking piece. But um, it's like no, the, and this and I, go round. In fact, I graduated from high school in 1980. So oh, you poor I'm thing. old. And and and. This go round, it's like, oh, by the way, this big Chinese thing's going to land in the sky. We don't know where yet, but you all have a nice night. And they go to Jimmy Kimmel, <laughs> and you sit there like, okay, what, what? <laughs> yes. I mean, sh should I get the roof done? What? It's just unbelievable, and mm -hmm. you know, it's not like this is unusual because we get hit by space junk continuously. This just happens to be something that could impact the planet like an asteroid. Exactly. You know, exactly. And, and they, there's so little conversation about it. That's right. And I realize they don't want to create mass hysteria. Well, but they do with everything else. They do with everything else. That's right. And may I point out, and I'm very, very impatient with, with technology and progress. Very impatient. Me too. I, I want my Jetson car. I want my Jetson car, and 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 I make a point in the book about bionics. Even Lee Majors can't get bionics, but they, you know, they're still talking about them. And I've been sitting back watching the the drip, drip, drip of tech promised technology for about fifty something years now, and still we ain't got our flying cars. And last month, you know, they're 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 just losing their minds about how wonderful it was where we landed something on Mars. Last month, 53 people died in a submarine uh, yep. near, in, near Indonesia, and we haven't got a technology to go help people like that. And, and in the world I live in, you know, get your backyard in order first before you start looking in other people's yards. You know, Sweep your own back porch. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I mean, spend, spend your billions on helping people down here first before, you know, you start spending billions about, sending something that can take pictures on Mars is my, my opinion. Well, you know, we're yeah, always yeah, wanted as such inquisitive people, but I agree that you do need to take care of the things that need to be resolved here first. Mm -hmm. Because if yes, we don't exactly. do that, we're not equal players in anything. Yeah, and we, we don't know. Um, <laughs> when people start to examine the issue of space junk, stuff we have in orbit, used mm -hmm. and unused, um, dormant and active, you begin to realize something very sobering. Japan has a space program. India has a space program. Brazil has a space program. Everybody seems to be having a space program. And India, I believe it is, check me somebody, is planning in the, about the next year or so to land a woman on the moon. Yes. Not just and not just any woman. It has to be a woman of color. We seem to be using science now for more social achievements than actual technical achievements. And whatever we don't put in space is being used down here to kind of enhance what we already are living with. Uh, we're, right. we're we're going to be reaching a point here shortly where there's a camera everywhere. We're pretty daggum close right this minute. Exactly. And if you really uh, needed to know, then they have satellite imagery that they can get from space. Right. If there's an exactly. area that was not covered. We've got our, we're at our break. Did you want to finish a thought before we go? No, um, I, I, I don't have a thought. I thought you had one. I may oh have gosh, to Oh gosh, we're yours. in trouble. We've got another hour to go. But seriously, <laughs> you know, I am... I am so interested in this conversation, but I did not know that the requisite was that it had to be a woman of color going up with India. I thought it could just be a woman. So I will, I will read up on that, but we will be back. 
This is our top of the hour news break. I'm hoping they're always hoping there's a little good news out there. We'll find out. We'll be back. Y'all come back too. This message comes from NPR sponsor Verbo. Your family reunion is more important than ever. That's why Verbo has whole vacation homes for the whole family and just the family. No shared room or spaces. Download the Verbo app. The time for getting back together is now. Live from NPR News, I'm Janine Herbst. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been working the phones to appeal for calm in the Middle East. He's just arrived in Denmark for a stop on a trip meant to focus on the Arctic, as NPR's Michelle Kellerman reports. On the way to Copenhagen, Blinken was speaking by phone to his counterparts in Qatar, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. He's trying to calm tensions in the Middle East while on a long-planned trip that will take him to an Arctic Council meeting in Iceland. Arctic issues are among the many topics Blinken is raising here in Denmark. One aide says the trip is part of an effort to repair relations with transatlantic allies. Asked if that meant backing off from former President Trump's attempts to buy Greenland, the aide laughed, saying the U.S. is pursuing relations with Greenland as part of the Kingdom of Denmark. Michelle Kellerman, NPR News, Copenhagen. Dr. Anthony Fauci told graduates at Georgia's Emory University today to right the wrongs of racism and inequality exposed by the global pandemic. As Lisa Hagen with member station WABE reports, he gave the commencement speech virtually. The National Institute of Health's infectious disease director told students COVID-19 uncovered a stark reality and failing of our society. The unacceptable disparities in health experienced by minority groups especially African-Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans. Dr. Fauci also told graduates the pandemic showed the global interconnections between developed and developing nations. He asked that each student dedicate themselves to fighting inequality, whether professionally or otherwise. For NPR News, I'm Lisa Hagen in Atlanta. Tropical storm Tok Tai is heading toward India's west coast, carrying winds of up to 100 miles an hour. NPR's Lauren Freyer reports from Mumbai, where unseasonal rains have started ahead of landfall, expected early this week. India's meteorological department says Tokte has intensified into a very severe cyclonic storm. The government says it's trying to maintain telecom services and drinking water and prevent disruptions to industrial plants generating medical oxygen for COVID-19 patients. Hundreds of patients in coastal Mumbai have been shifted to hospitals farther inland. Indian Railways has cancelled some long-distance trains in the western states of Maharashtra and Gujarat. The storm is expected to make land fall Monday night with heavy rain, wind and storm surge with up to 25-foot waves. Heavy rain has already hit Kerala on India's southwest coast and an empty building collapsed into the sea there. Lauren Freyer, NPR News, Mumbai. U.S. futures contracts are trading in positive territory at this hour. Dow futures contract up a fraction. NASDAQ futures contract is up about two-tenths of a percent. You're listening to NPR News. In Myanmar, a civilian militia fighting the military in the northwestern town of Mindat is now withdrawing after a large-scale military assault on the town. Armed resistance against the military has been growing since the February 1st coup. Michael Sullivan reports from neighboring Thailand. Reports from Mindat say the civilian militia withdrew in part to avoid more damage to the town where the military had been using artillery, helicopter gunships, and ground troops against the lightly armed civilian militia. In a statement, the U.S. Embassy called on the military to cease violence against civilians, including in Mindat, which it called a further demonstration of the depths the regime will sink to to hold on to power. Michael Sullivan reporting. The Zimbabwean government says it will appeal Saturday's ruling by the High Court that reverses the five-year extension of the Chief Justice after he reached the retirement age of 70. As Ishma Fundikwa reports, Justice Minister Ziambi Ziambe accused the country's judiciary of being, quote, captured by foreign forces seeking to destabilize the government. 
The Justice Minister's angry statement sets the stage for a battle between the judiciary and the executive. Last October, judges wrote a letter to the President and the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission citing political interference in their work by the executive, state agencies and Chief Justice Luke Malaba. Ishma Fundika reporting from Harare. And I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the second hour of Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. We are just having a great conversation with my guest, Frank Bennett. And if you're looking for information on Fate, you can go to FateMag.com. And you can find archives, you can find trading cards, you can find shirts, you can find all the things that are fate. And, you know, we've been in publications since 1948. It's a pretty good run. And Phyllis is still getting those new editions out and doing a great job at it. Check it out. Frank, you know, when we were discussing before we went to the break about the Indian Space Program, the um, NASA is going to be helping them get to the moon, but it's the first woman and the first person of color. So it's not quite so specific that it's disqualifying everybody else from being able to go. And at first I thought that it was. I mis- misunderstood, misread what was there. Well, that was my fault. I I had a mini stroke. That was my fault. (laughs) I was going to blame it on mine, but that's okay. I'll let you take this one for the team. Yeah. Well, you're blonde. I'm wondering. I'm wondering why you didn't go for that defense. Oh, please. There's physical. (laughs) There's physical evidence that I am not a blonde. So I don't. I don't think we should talk about it. It's all the gray that's in there. (laughs) It's all the gray that's in there. (laughs) It's okay. But. You know, oh, sugar. something that I am, you know, to go back to all this stuff happening in space and all the things going on, you know, and I, I understand that India has not landed on the moon and they would be very interested. It would be a feather in their cap to be able to do that. But, <clears throat> you know, we're trying to get volunteer astronauts to make that one-way trip to Mars and set up colonization there at a place that has already been through that, that is dead for all intents and purposes. And, yeah, we should be considering ways to make that oxygen here, I think. I'm an explorer, too. But we have so many people living in poverty and and so many people living with you know diseases that have already been eradicated in most of the world. We have people that are living in grossly polluted areas. We need to be able to, you know, adjust that, don't you think? Oh, like I said, we should be taking care of our backyard before we start exploring other people's backyards. Well, I think there's time to do both, and if they you know, quit going wild with the money, there would be the cash to do both. <clears throat> but well, I want to know more. In... Hmm? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say that I want to know more about these these prophecies that you see happening. We've got a Chatter who says um, that they think we're in the part of Daniel's prophecy that they go out to kill as many people as possible. And in Revelation, the same part about doing that with the dragon and the heavenly signs. So what say you? Okay. Could you, could you, I'm not sure if I understood that. Could you read that again? I can. The, okay. the chatter says that, I think we're in the part of Daniel's prophecy where they go out to kill as many as possible. I would assume the government 
and Revelation the same part about killing as many as possible with the dragon and the heavenly signs. And Okay. I wish they were a little more specific because I can't I'm not equating those two. Well, uh, I'm not the, really um, either, but I do think that, you know, dragon for a lot of people would be Well, okay. Well, in the um I can address the issue of the dragon. That's very specific because that appears in the book of Revelation. And yes. in the book of Revelation, the dragon is actually um, a being that rises, comes to power in the world after the Antichrist does. And Scripture says that it has all of the powers of the first, they're referred to as beasts, has all the powers of the first beast and are able to deceive men with great wonders and stuff like that and works all wonders in sight of the first beast. That's uh, that's what they refer to in the Book of Revelation. Okay. Now, if they're talking about if they're talking about a dragon with the um, you know with the wonder in heaven and having ten heads, uh, seven heads and ten horns, that is actually referring to the world and the world uh, world governing body. That's what that dragon is. And oh, I didn't um, know that. Right, and. I, I see. I see. Also, that it's making a back reference to, um, you know, Drewer's Tale, and took down the third part of uh, third part of the stars of heaven, and this is, of course, casting out Satan and his followers in the, uh, you know, the great revolt revert- that took place before the founding of the world. Um, but that that is really a flashback for the purposes of it determining its heritage, and. Um, cast over that the same dragon actually runs the world system so you know you've got two different you've got two different ident- um, um, entities that are referred to as dragon here one of course is satan of course but the false prophet that rises after the antichrist is also referred to as a dragon do you think that revelations is a, <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> in chronological order not all of it is. Not all of it is. Like, and like I was saying up here, you you go up to the book of Revelation chapter twelve, and it starts talking about um, how the how the the dragon Satan, of course, was cast out of heaven and drew one third of the stars. That's a flashback to the heritage of of the dragon, and where today and why it persecutes the the woman, which is Israel, that brought forth the child Jesus Christ. And so the world is going to be moving into a position in the book of Revelation where it begins to persecute Israel, which brought forth the man-child, Jesus Christ. There's a lot to this sitting there. It can be pretty complicated. Names, names tend to throw people off. I and this so. is what we're going to be... This is what we're... Now, now the reference to Daniel, I, I'm not entirely sure what they're referring to there. But uh, what we're going to be seeing here, especially in the next 20 years, is a world organizing itself. You know, the, everybody's going to be choosing sides. Um, the, uh, the, the current powers and the way they're organized under the UN are going to just simply get stronger. The United States will get weaker. And there, there's going to be a more uh, unifying front against Israel. That same front will be against Russia, the king of the north, and that same front will be against um, Egypt and the, um, and the um, uh, Middle Eastern nations that are against Israel. Uh, these, these entities will form um, you know, the major players that will meet in the plain of Armageddon to fight the war of, to fight the war of Armageddon. Well... Those alignments seem interesting. Yeah, and we could we could start to see it. You know, nations making friends with other nations and making uh, peace deals. Believe it or not, uh, one of the weakest entities in the world, the European Union, will become the strongest, and many of uh, the nations will follow dictate under uh, the European Union. Really. Well, the European Union started way back in 1958, 
with only four yeah. countries. They were called the Benelux uh, nations, you know, Belgium, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Netherlands, stuff like that. And since then, they have grown to encompass about 36 nations. Um, there was a row a little while ago where they were trying to get Turkey to join, and uh, there was a lot of fighting and stuff going on about that. And this is what the Ukraine war was all about, uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Ukraine wanted to join um, the European Union, and the president at the time uh, went and, and uh, talked to Vladimir Putin, and Putin convinced him to stay with Russia. And so um, he went and told the European Union, thank you, but no thank you, we're going to stick with Mother Russia. And that's when the Civil War started. Because what would happen is when you join the European Union, you do what they tell you to do. You, they operate your economy the way they tell you to work. You know, they tell you how to run your economy. They tell you how to run everything. And uh, borders come down. Uh, it's 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 just as easy to travel from um, you know from Germany into Poland as it is to drive from Pennsylvania into Ohio. That's how they want the entire world to be, and uh, the world uh, will be one day taking the majority of all of its dictates from Europe. As a matter of fact, we're going to reach a point here in the next 20 years where the borders will become so solvent, um, insolvent, excuse me, uh, under uh, the upcoming uh, deals that are be coming out of Europe that you would be able to drive from the United States into Canada just as easily as you drive from Tennessee into Kentucky. Well, Canada is very particular about their borders at this point. So I find that to be interesting. We're not so picky. Yeah, can, but. Well, well Canada, Canada, of course, is, is a dependent of the UK. Right. Uh, they don't. They have their own government. That's true. But they're a dependent uh, nation. They're 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 um, they really are reliant on the UK uh, for a lot of important decisions, just like Australia is. Well, I just find that interesting because every everybody seems to be having opinions about everybody else's situations. I find it interesting that they're going to be in a position to affect the U.S. is and Canadian, which is a holding of England, Great Britain. Yeah, this is all such weird stuff. To me, it's weird. Yeah. Bible prophecy, people have to be clear about what Bible prophecy is and is not. It is not predicting the future. The future has already been planned out by the Lord himself in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. This was done as an answer to Adam allowing sin to enter into the world. The Lord made the world a certain way. Everybody was made a certain way, and we were all supposed to exist for all eternity that way, and the world as well. When Adam permitted sin to enter into the world, that changed everything. And it changed the very nature of all things. This is also why we have a paranormal. Uh, the spirit world existed a certain way until sin was allowed to enter into the world, and when sin entered into the world, that gave the that gave the uh, spirit realm more access to the living realm, the physical realm. You see, well, and so and so and it was never meant to be that way. There's there's a there's a there's an expiration date to these things, and. <clears throat> um, what you see late, you know, in Genesis chapter 3, the Lord laid out a plan for how to redeem mankind and the world from the sin that was permitted to enter into the world. And once, and I realize the book of Revelation is very confusing, but I invite everybody instead to look past that and look at the last three chapters. And they'll notice something fascinating, is that the last uh, two or three chapters of the book of Revelation look a lot like the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. And that's because at the end of all the trials and tribulations of mankind, at the end of all the testing, 
and after all of those who uh, tried to destroy the world are, are judged and punished. The Lord does a renovation of the world, and he restores it to the way that he intended it to be to begin with. That's the beautiful part to all of this, is that in the end, the world is made the world uh, made in the way the Lord had originally intended it to be. Well, you know, that would actually be pretty cool, because if they could do that without having to go out and you know, slaughter people whose lands they wanted, which is what we have done so very much as a species, I think it would be fantastic. Yeah, and I, we're going mean, to have to think, the world's going to have to go through a lot plan, to get there. It would be bloody to get there. Yeah, I'm going to have to go through a lot to get there. And, you know, and I'm trying to guide people over all of the, you know, the nitty gritty about the book of Revelation and prophecy and all that. What they really should focus on is what Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, when he's asked what shall be the signs of his coming. They should focus more on that yes. because, as we were talking about before, there's a reason why the word watch appears more than 120 times in Scripture. Jesus wanted us to watch. And in Matthew 24, you get more or less a laundry list of what to watch for. And as I've said on other programs, um, he mentions pestilences. And we ju we're just coming out of one pestilence. And right. he, used the, he used the plurality. There's more coming, and people should be, be prepared for that. And you can already see by that laundry list of things Jesus mentions, a lot of the signs that are, are, are spoken of have already started. Yes. I and... liken the same thing to this global warming issue, because um, the sun itself, its output has increased in the past 20 years. And I don't know about you folks. I don't know about you all down there, but up here, it's... Um, it's May, near uh, you know this is the third third week of May, and our overnights are in the forties. Are they really? And, yeah, and during the when I just came back from the West Coast, it didn't get. Um, I was um, I was at a hotel that had a great pool, nice salt water pool, loved it, nice and warm, and you were afraid to get out because it was sixty degrees. It happens. Seriously. They, they, there's going to be, uh, in terms of the global warming thing, yeah, the sun's getting hotter, and Scripture does say that um, the vial of judgment was poured upon the sun, where it would scorch men with great heat. And what you pay attention to in that verse of Scripture is that the word vial is used. That's a thin glass tube used to dispense chemicals. Vials are meant to dispense in small doses, over a long period of time, mm -hmm. segments, and the sun is that's that's a gradual dosing, and the sun is gradually warming, and it will get to the point where we're going to have super extreme scorching heat in various parts of the world, but the the actual air temperature itself will fluctuate between stifling hot and extremely cold. Well, it sounds like our springs here. Mm-hmm. That. Yeah, it's, like I said, it's mid-May, and our overnights are in the 40s. You know, I'm going to be out there later this week, and that's not what I wanted to hear. Well, it's going to warm up a little bit, and by, I do mean <laughs> a little bit. I hate cold, but not truly. I mean, it yeah, just so, sometimes makes parts that aren't as young right, as they I, once I, were. I would, with all of this Bible prophecy stuff, you, you kind of – there's a lot of detail, and you can get really bogged down in the details. You've got to go back to the big messages, and the big message, the first place I send people is the book of Matthew chapter 24. Right. And begin with that because Jesus opens the entire passage by saying, you know, let's not ye be, you know, don't let yourself be deceived. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. Yeah. I mean, that's the first thing he says. 
Well, there's so many people that are so positive all the time. When I was doing a paranormal show out in um, Kansas some years right. ago, I was sitting at my table. This is where I met. This is where I met my really good friend Denise Pridemore, uh, who was on Ghost Adventures and the Sally House and stuff like that. I love Denise. Love Ron. If you're listening, miss you guys. Love you guys. I'll be seeing you soon. Anyway, uh, I was I was looking to my right. I'm, I'm sorry, my left, talking to somebody. And by the time uh, I looked over to my right, and it was very, like only a minute, there was a man sitting next to me at my table. And I can't name him, but he came there just to see me, which was scary. And he brought with himself uh, um, a lot of papers, and he gave them for me, to me to read. And when I read them, they were really scary. <laughs> this oh, wow. man did not – yeah, they. I mean he had been – he had been spending so much time trying to read things into Bible prophecies that he kind of felt like he could actually name who the Antichrist is, and he had a lot of calculations and formulas and stuff like that. And it was not the work of a balanced mind, I'll right. say that much. And, uh, you know, he didn't stalk me. I'm well, not a bad guy. Uh, wanted to friend me on Facebook. I said no. And But, there, there you know... <laughs> there are people who get themselves so bogged down into the details about Bible prophecy. It's best to let God, uh, let the Lord guide you through this stuff, as opposed to you trying to use your mathematical, uh, in, you know, mind to try to figure it all out. I mean, it's not a puzzle. It's not a. It's not a. It's not an equation to be solved. It will solve itself for you if you let yourself be guided. Well, I too have had, you know, I, I, 70s, 80s were just very much people that were you know, predicting the actual days. And I mean, at one point in the very late 70s, people were, you know, sitting in churches. Because the world was supposed to end that day. Exactly. I actually, you know, my my youth group was all in a tizzy. So, exactly. You know, you just kind of have to get out of, because it also says no one will know. You have to pay. That's right. Yeah, you, know, you have to watch, but no one will know. That's right. And, you know, I I really get I'm interested in in biblical prophecy. I really am. I'm I am always interested in learning things that are kind of out of my wheelhouse. But I don't like people who forget to live while they're researching this stuff. You know, because you still have a life to live and you can still study and learn and be attentive. But you also have to remember that you're supposed to be, while you're watching, taking care of what is your responsibility to take care of. I find a lot of people hone in and sometimes... Like the gentleman you mentioned, that becomes their primary goal in life is to be able to solve, you know, what seems to them to be a puzzle. I, I I had actually been thinking a lot about him over time, and I wondered if he was not <clears throat> he was not tormented by a spirit because there's a certain kind of um, you know there's a certain kind of um, depravity in the human spirit that happens when a spirit compels you to seek after things for reasons that are not uh, not godly. And by that I mean that, you know, he was, I, I kind of felt that me, he had been maybe suffering a form of, um, I don't know, a form of anxiety that compelled him to have to find this because he himself may have been afraid uh, that he would not find the answer. Right. And I don't know if I'm making, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but there are people are. who get a little obsessed about knowing the answer because they're afraid if they don't, 
they'll they'll something bad will happen, you know that kind of thing. Well, sure. I mean, we are we are very interesting creatures, and sometimes we get locked into a mindset, and it just is. So, Sherry wants to know: so are all these doomsday prep? preppers fueled by all these things they've read in the Bible and perceive it to be more than it actually is. It's, I'm not going to say it's wrong to be a prepper, but it's wrong to be it, – people are over-preparing because what everybody is forgetting <clears throat> is that there's a global society coming, and they are going to do everything they can to make you a part of it. Mm-hmm. So let's say that – you know. They like to say, you know, the stuff hits the fan, and you can't get gas, you can't get food, or whatever. Uh, anarchy. Okay, now if if Satan's goal is to gather the entire world together so that they can see and hear the words of Antichrist and choose him as leader, thus coming to their own damnation, what purpose would it serve to have a condition in place where everybody's living in, in caves and holes waiting for doomsday. Right. It, it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't compute that way. If there is going to be a disruption in your lives at all of access to you know, necessities, it's going to be short-lived. I personally, my wife and I have a store uh, ourselves, and it's only going to run a six months on, on, a, you know, on the outside. That, that's about as much as you can reasonably expect uh, everything you rely and depend upon to be inaccessible. Because like I said, the big deal, you know, when you get past um, what I was talking about with Matthew chapter 24, something else everybody should pay attention to is Second Thessalonians chapter 2, because that is the appearance of Antichrist. And when you, you read Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, you realize that the entire world is gathered to see this guy. How can everybody in the world be gathered to see and hear this guy if they're hiding in holes? And how can he sell his message to all these people uh, if, um, if, if he cannot be seen or heard? And also they have to remember that in order for you to be damned, you have to look at him, listen to him, and choose to follow Antichrist. Cannot do that if you're hiding in a hole in the ground. This is true. The Lord will not damn you for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. He will not damn you because an, an, an army showed up and forced you to comply with some kind of edict you don't care for. He will not damn you for that. But if you look and listen to somebody who sounds like somebody you've read about in Scripture who might be the devil himself, and you choose to follow him, you have essentially secured your own damnation. That is scripture. I can see that. It's okay to have a little extra hanging around, you know. Uh, just well, don't plan long term. Yes. Well, you know, I am just really interested. This is going to be, yeah, you know, it's going to be such an an interesting time as people are really and truly preparing to to get through an extended length of time and and what's yeah well what's fascinating is how subtle it's all going to come about it'll all make perfect sense it, just as you see events happening in the world today it's going to make perfect sense how everybody is kind of gradually being kind of uh, herded towards this goal together as a nation yes well, you know, it's interesting, too, because Sherry um, said so the mark of the beast currently is us having vaccination cards to access daily needs. And she said, I'm kidding, but it's kind of funny. And, and it's scary because, well, like I said, Jesus said there's going to be pestilences. There are more coming. And if our governments are given the reason to, they can compel you to have inoculations. They can do it. And, mar- you know, martial law is a far stretch, but it depends on the severity of the, of the crisis circumstance. It's not far-fetched. 
No, it's not. You know, I mean, this they is, want to do it. They want to ahead. do it this time. However, they're not allowed to go around uh, compelling people to have to take a vaccine that they're not even completely sure works. You know what's funny? I got to put this in here. I like to uh, listen to a comedian named Bill Maher on HBO. Yes. And and you know. Uh, He's very balanced. I didn't used to think that way of him, but he's very balanced. And what's funny is is that he was on board with the vaccination thing and telling everybody, hey, it seems to make sense. We should. He got fully vaccinated, and lo and behold, he came down with COVID. And yeah. he's not doing his show this week because he got COVID. Nine players on the New York yes. Yankees ball team vaccinated, Absolutely. got COVID. So – that that's one of the reasons I think why they're kind of stepping away from mandating everybody get vaccinated. It's because it's way too easy to sue the government over cases where people get vaccinated and get sick anyways. Well, you know, and something else that's interesting is that you know, the <clears throat> you do have to have a vac <clears throat> a vaccination card because in order they started that on the news today that, well, you can go without a mask and unvaccinated people have to wear one, but are you really going to trust them? Do they not need something that shows that, you know, they're vaccinated? And so they can be faked. They are, they're pushing it for travel. They're pushing mm -hmm. the need for absolutely getting in back in school. You can't go on a college campus without your vaccination cards is the, plan for next year so right. and with all the technicalities people are starting to see the politics because yes you know what why can't why can't it be mandatory for schools uh but it is mandatory for some colleges and that's because colleges are privately owned yes and uh they're, they're private uh, corporations public schools are different the taxpayer runs the schools uh well they they, they own the schools and yes. they're run by 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 councils and the, now the politics come in for people who have private businesses. Well, private businesses can mandate it. They own it. Public cannot. Yeah. So now people are seeing the politics and well, the hypocrisy. Well, to have a less than 24 hour window of you've got to wear a mask, you're going to wear a mask for years. You're going to wear, you know, from the guy that wanted you to wear two. To the next day, CDC says, nope, you're free. Fly, be free. You know, yeah. it's just really an interesting concept that happens so fast. It, it was like and, uh, right before you and I came on air, I was looking at a news story, and there was a picture of Joe Biden walking through a cemetery, but somebody had a mask on. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if somebody shopped that to have the Grim Reaper following behind him in the cemetery? That would be a hoot. That would draw interest, without a doubt. But, you know, I just, I just think that there is so much, so much that there, that is happening that is just so bizarre. And you know, in chat, April says it's the start of more Christian persecution, but it's not, it's not faith-based. It is if you're going to comply with the government edict based. So. Well, yeah, but yeah, remember how they, uh, in the last 10 years, they've been really, really going after families that don't believe in vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Remember that. I mean, that that's only been set aside because of other news stories. Believe me, they're going to go right back to that. Absolutely. Uh, up in up in um, Canada, they have been arresting uh, pastors yes. and preachers who have been holding services. Yes, they have arresting them. That's actually happened here in the states as well. Mm-hmm. And like I said, Jesus says more are coming. He said pestilences. More are coming, so you can expect the fun times to get fewer and fewer, and more. I would say anxiety uh, to come into the picture because we're not sure when the next shoe is going to drop. 
right. and what the government's going to make us do because of it. Well, I, we are just about to be at a break, but, you know, I'm really, I try to be, my dad used to tell me that I was a Pollyanna, that I was much too old to be that damn my age. But, you know, it really is interesting to watch this stuff because, you know, I am not, well, I'm sorry, kind of I am, given my jobs, <laughs> right? I research and I learn about a lot of conspiracy theories. It's what I do. It's what I talk about. But, um, but I also talk about dimensionality and stuff like that, too. So it's a lot of fun. But there's so much that would have to fall into place in order to override entire citizenry. And people are like, oh, well, it could never happen here. Well, you know, it could never happen in Germany either. It certainly couldn't have happened in France. You know, it couldn't have happened here 100 years ago, 130 years ago. You know, there's no way that you could pit brother against brother or father against son or you know, turn your neighbor in because they weren't the right faith. Or, you know, it's easy to blow this kind of thing off, yet history says it's absolutely possible and sometimes probable. You know, it's we've lost our sense of communities. You know, small town living is no longer small town, although New York has lost a lot of its population, so maybe some of them are learning that again. But it's just really astounding that people will go, oh, well, that can't happen. There's no way that can happen. When totally well, yeah, it they, does, they've, it has. They've been, they started this about 15 years ago where, um, you know, the global powers that be, and especially our media, wanted you to stop kind of thinking small. They didn't want you thinking so much about, you know, your mm -hmm. your you know, your own little world, your own little small town or just the United States. They wanted you thinking more on a global scale about everything, how what you yeah. do here affects people on the other side of the world and stuff like that. They they they're trying to really mentally prepare everybody to go through everything as a global society as opposed yes. to just you and your own little problems in your own backyard. How what yeah. I do here affects somebody on the other side of the world. Absolutely. And it is possible for us to go to break. We'll be right back. Y'all come right back too. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Come on, I'm Southern, but, um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see if the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. 
you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. We are back. Thank you so much for joining us. And this is the final segment of the show with Frank J. Bennett. And we have been discussing uh, biblical prophecy as well as space, science, all kinds of interesting things. And I will tell you that this really wasn't the direction necessarily that I expected the show to go, but it's been interesting to me. And it's brought back to mind some things that I had really, Frank, over the years not paid much attention to. And we had a question. Oh, we're going to take this question really quick before we get to your work. But Daniel says many countries will fall, but Adam, Moab, and leaders of Ammon will be delivered. Who are those people today? I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to research that again. I don't remember who they are. Okay, well, that'll be fun, and then you can shoot it over to me, and we'll schedule another show just to discuss that. Or you could just post it on your Facebook. But um, whatever you want. But, well, he's referring to the Song of Solomon. Yes. Uh, but... Um, I'm going to have to reread this while you're talking and see if I can put it back in its context. I haven't looked at this in a while. Okay, well. We Isn't it amazing have... how freaking honest I am? It is. <laughs> I like it. Well, hey, you know, it's always better to say I'm not sure than to try to bluster your way through. I learned a long time ago just to say, well, you know, that's my fault, but let me see if I can fix it. So that was a tough lesson to learn, but I'm glad I did. While you're looking, you know, I just got a question about a hashtag that says encounter with the wah, with the Aberdeen wild moth because I ran out of letters. <laughs> what about the encounters with the Aberdeen wild men? Yeah, what about it? Oh, um, in, in short... <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll try to make this quick. In short, the Aberdeen Wild Man is a humanoid creature I encountered on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, where I grew up at uh, back in 1980, when I was still young and awesome, and not old, broken down, and decrepit like I am today. <laughs> well, I are you kidding? Just... I, I hold my arms on with crazy glue and duct tape. Come on, I'm falling wow. apart over here. Hey. Little duct tape fixes everything, and if it can't, well, then they can't be fixed. So, did you actually come across one and see them and experience things? Well, now, and this is a wonderful lesson about the paranormal. It happens so subtle, mm -hmm. and it's something that can confused you into thinking that it was a something of the natural world, and it actually wasn't until it was too late. And I thought I was looking at uh, – it wasn't uncommon back then for somebody to, to overdo it with the alcohol or the drugs and just kind of go in the woods and sleep it off. So I kind of thought I was I was looking at uh, some, some guy that was on a meth trip or something. And uh, aside from all the other feelings and strange occurrences around it, I, I was kind of – you could have had me convinced I was just looking at somebody who was just really getting over the drugs. And then I watched him make this vertical leap of more than 15 feet into the trees oh. overhead and proceed to scamper up about another 30 feet or so and, you know, running through the trees, screaming and hollering like an ape. And, you know, humans can't do that. And that, is uh, rule. Th that was a really deceptive portion of it is that it looked very natural up to that point. And, and um, I also uh, write in there how – you know, when I thought it was safe, you know, when it was gone out of sight for a while and it was safe to leave, that something that I could not see was actually following me out of the woods all the way out to the highway. Um, so it, it's um, – you'd have to uh, actually – I'm sorry to say this like everybody else, but you have to read the whole encounter in the book to get Absolutely. the gist of it. 
but 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 when I, it was it happened on the coldest day of the year, cat, and it was bright and sunny outside. I mean, it was single digits. Everything was frozen over. That's what I was doing out there to begin with. I was walking on the ice, and and you know, in one of the small islands out there in the marshes, well, small. It was about the width of a football field and the length of two football fields. Uh, I saw this 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 what appeared to be a man staring at me through the brush, and. Uh, it didn't look like a regular man. It looked like if if a human being had been burnt to a char, had these oh, very man. large eyes, and it was wearing clothing. And it was single digits outside. And I'm wearing my I'm dressed for it. I got my B-52 flight jacket on and all that. And it's wearing a button down shirt and slacks. And nothing about it really made sense. And to this day, nothing about it really makes sense. And, but the fact is, is that I sensed its presence before I even saw it. It had a very powerful spirit field about it that actually touched me and affected me before I even laid eyes on it. That is so astounding. And, um, you know, in in the same book, I encounter other uh, strange and bizarre encounters with other, other types of beings. But, right. you know, the, re the reason why it's called that is because I spend a nice chunk of the book trying to reconcile uh, what I saw with other you know, creatures and beings, both in nature and in the paranormal, looking for answers to explain it. Well, I spend a lot of time looking for those, too, and they are sometimes very elusive. Quite, yes, quite. Now, my second book is called A Ghost in Philadelphia. Yes. And it's it's based on a – I've never written out a fiction work like that before. It's paranormal science fiction. And I created the term paranormal science fiction. And like I tell everybody else, I want a nickel every time somebody says it. <laughs> and it's based on a fundamental question. If the founding fathers had somehow had a way of seeing what the United States was like today, knowing that, would they have even bothered at all? Oh, and so I, cre I created a science fiction story using paranormal uh, a lot of paranormal aspects to it that send a man's spirit because you can't send a physical object you send a spirit because the spirit has energy and you can transmit energy back in time to june 1776 philadelphia to witness the founding and to answer these questions and while there I, he actually has to exist in june 1976 philadelphia as a spirit so that's why it's called Ghost in Philadelphia. I love that. And all the wonderful things that come with being a spirit. Well, you have one more. Uh, yeah, you have questions about that other book? <laughs> Actually, I have questions about the Ghost in Philadelphia. Oh, please, yes. Well, the whole concept of coming back and trying to ponder if it was actually worth doing. I think that's a great, a great beginning idea. And I know that you probably had a great time building around it. How long did that take to write? It took me six months to write the book because... There, what you first do is you write out your framework and everything mm -hmm. you want to say in the book, okay? It's a generalized framework work of all the ideas. And then you start mapping, and you write out all the ideas you got for the book. And then you start assembling them in the order you want them in and in the order you want to tell the story in. Then you know, And then you do research and check your details, and make sure the science lines up, make sure the I, – in order to research that book, I actually had to read the minutes of the Continental Congress from June and July 1776 and what they were talking about day by day by day. And I was astounded how concerned the Founding Fathers and the Continental Congress were with Canada because they were constantly expecting an invasion from Canada because the British owned Canada. Yes. Uh, that part really stuck out. Um, and, of course, you know, appropriations for Washington's troops and things like that really ruled the day. 
uh, but that was that was a big part of the research. I also researched uh, the details about the founders' individual lives, you know, who they lived with. Uh, for example, Thomas Jefferson traveled with a with a uh, personal house servant. You can call it a slave house servant. His name is Jupiter, and I I figure Jupiter into the story as kind of comic relief. Because he encounters the uh, the hero of the story many times in his spirit form and is scared to death, so oh. I needed some comic relief in it, and how animals react to, you know, the hero of the story as a spirit and stuff like that. And then 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 comes the worst part of the whole process, because what you wrote out is probably a thousand you know a thousand pages long, too long for anybody to be patient with. Then you got to edit and cut it down to something a little more manageable like three four hundred pages that's the part that hurts because you got to leave out a lot of stuff that you think really helps your story how do you do that i mean um, how, how did it you ain't easy how did you get to it you go, go go to the editing process yes i mean how do you ascertain uh, well it's it's, I guess it's, it's like scripture it's like scripture. It's got to. It's you know, one paragraph has got to have continuity to the next, and mm -hmm. one scene has got to set up the next. And that's how I wrote the third book out. Um, Don, Don and I over the phone, long distance, uh, would throw back and forth ideas for this story because you know she's a stage actress, yes. and she really saw the whole thing as a, as a stage play. And so I had to construct we're, – we're talking about the book Talk Dirty to Me, which I would never have written if I didn't know Dawn. But um, I constructed the whole story with Dawn in mind to play the, the lead character on a stage in about four or five acts. So that's why the book is written out that way. It's kind of written out like a stage play. That's harder to write. I think. Well, yeah, it it would normally be, but I used to be a stage actor. So I'm it, when I'm writing out the story, I'm actually not thinking about the characters as I am thinking about what's called the blocking. You know, you know, as as if you're actually standing on a stage right. and a character comes in to deliver his lines, how he's going to walk in from stage right, stage left, downstage, whatever, and you know how he would how they would have to turn and present to the audience and stuff like that. So I wrote it thinking about being on a stage and having Dawn in the, the lead role. And of course, Dawn didn't want it to be very long because she had trouble with dialogue. So it, I had to condense it quite a bit. Well, that is so interesting. Thanks for sharing that. You know, hey, we, are just a, we are just about out of time. And I, I don't want to leave without you telling people how to find you. Well, my private address is secret, but my stalker finds me anyways. Go figure. <laughs> well, she's very good then. But she's the best. You can't ask for a better stalker. Hey, Carrie, love you, babe. And um, um, they can find me on Amazon. Uh, just type in Frank J. Bennett into your Google, and everything you want to know about me comes up. But please remember to make sure you put the J in between the Frank and the Bennett, because if you don't, you'll get a creepy lounge singer in Las Vegas. Not even oh, close to kidding on that one. Well, I did find call. somebody that did not look like you. So I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope so. he, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for doing that, but it is the truth. Well, I hope he does it too because he's actually, you know, seems like an interesting man. But we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming. And for those with the questions in chat, thank you all too because, you know, I knew that we were going to be discussing world events relevant to, to biblical prophecy. But... It really became quite an interesting show just based on that, Frank. That was awesome. I mean, who would have thought it would be interesting? Well, I knew it was Honestly. going to be interesting, but I didn't know we would cover so much of it. That was awesome. Yeah, and I'm just hoping we're all here tomorrow because we don't know when the next piece of space junk is going to land on top of us. <laughs> I actually used to worry about that, so... <laughs>
yeah, when I was younger. And I guess it was the result of the Skylab thing, but yeah, you know, lived on a farm out in the middle of Georgia somewhere. And I, I would just be, you know, looking up every so often. It well, that's crazy. stuff like that likes to land on little farms out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, it was just, it was crazy. But, well, you'll have to join me again sometime. This has been fun. It's been I a am, huge. We, I am, you're just fun. I enjoy oh, I'm you. okay for, yeah, I'm okay. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> for everybody no, no. who is... <laughs> No, no, this is my second time on your show. I'm really, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for being so professional. Well, thank you for being such a great guy. You know, I, no, I'm okay. I like you okay. But for everyone listening, thank you so much because I've learned a lot of stuff in this show. And I've, I've been glad of that because we live in a strange time. And people are always thinking that they know exactly when the end of time is or whatever. And, you know, nobody does. So take tonight's show and enjoy it. Research what you want and take from it what you can because it's awesome stuff. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate every single one of you. Now, we've got everybody coming up through the rest of the week. I will not be doing, um, probably not be doing a live show Wednesday. I'll be traveling. So take care. And you'll have a fantastic archive to listen to if I can't be live. And I've, I'm just having such a great time getting back out in the field, doing some more research, doing some investigation, and getting to see some of my friends, too. I hope that you're getting those chances. If not, you will soon, because I know that uh, Free Sherry is now hashtag freed with a D, Sherry, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for every one of you. So just remember, same cat time, same cat channel. Be blessed. Good night. You know what? I almost forgot to tell you. Be the change you want to see. Because we can do that. Take care. Hey, isn't isn't that Jim Jim Carrey's line from, um, uh, what was that movie he was in with Jennifer Aniston? Oh. Wasn't um, that his, his his line from um? Oh gosh, what was that? <laughs> I don't know, but it's my line, and okay, I, took, I took it from Gandhi. <laughs> Yeah, but okay. I really and yeah. truly believe that we can be the change we want to see in the world every day. And if you don't like the way that you're living, you're who changes that. So just do it. Make sure you're smiling. Those eyes, even if you're wearing a mask, those eyes will do it. Yeah, well, take care. That's a wonderful point because, because people needlessly fritter their days away with anxieties they don't need to have. Yes, they do. And, and the you can thank the media for that, for getting them pumped up and hyped up on stuff for no good reason. Um, but, you know, they could be happier if they, you know, were a little more aware, I think, and paid a little more attention about to their happiness. There you go. I love it when my guests agree with me. <laughs> it all works out. And share out. the same yes, mindset. Yes. It does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't want to disagree with the with 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 Cat. No, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to tempt fate. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! You went oh, there. Oh, that was oh, awesome. Yes, I did. Yes, I did say that. Yes, I did. I love it. <laughs> Thank you again, Frank. I have just I love talking with you, and hey, kiddo, we will what? do it again soon. Hey, kiddo, when why are you coming up to Ohio? I'm going to investigate at the Mansfield Reformatory. You mean next weekend? I mean Thursday. Hold on. Yeah. But Are you talking hold about that thought. The... Hold that thought. So, everybody, I've got to run. We're running out of time. We're out of time. 
Y'all have a great week. I'll see you next time. Good night. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama.